Well, welcome back to another episode of the Addy Hour. It's always my honor and privilege to host these conversations. And today, I'm grateful to be able to host Jeremy Lin and Esther Chu for a conversation about mental health, race, wellness, and um, culture in AAPI communities. So these are two individuals that likely need no introduction to you all as listeners, but I'm gonna go ahead and give them a brief introduction anyway. Starting out with Esther Chu, Dr. Chu is a physician and popular health science communicator. She's known as bold and innovative voice on gender and racial equity in healthcare. And she's also an advocate for new frameworks for building positive and productive workplaces. She graduated from Yale University as an undergrad, also went to the Yale School of Medicine for med school and currently has an NIH funded research program where she's looking at health services and health policy as a researcher. She's also the founding member of Times Up Healthcare. She has also been very active in the pandemic as well, where she's helped raise awareness about the critical shortage of personal protective equipment or PPE in hospitals. She also is a chief medical officer of JUPE, which uh, builds mobile healthcare units and so someone who's been very active in a lot of different roles. She also has numerous commentaries, which regularly appear in different places, including the New England Journal of Medicine, the Harvard Business Review, NBC, Think Self Courts, and the Washington Post. She's also a regular uh, columnist for The Lancet, and she regularly appears on CNN and MSNBC. So someone who's deeply invested in a lot of different spheres of influence and who continues to make an impact within her profession and in the general community as well. So I'm honored to welcome Dr. Esther Chu to the Addy Hour podcast. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me on. Of course. The second guest I'd like to introduce is none other than Jeremy Lin. Jeremy is a Palo Alto native and, of course, is one of the few Asian Americans to ever play in the NBA. Prior to his NBA career, he actually played four seasons at Harvard, where he was an all Ivy first team selection two times, both in 2009 and 2010. As a Yale professor, I'm giving him a little bit of grace for playing for the other team, uh, partially because he played for a coach amateur who's also a Duke graduate, as I am myself. So I couldn't help myself. I had to throw that in there. Uh, but Jeremy, as many of you all know, is someone who, after uh, being undrafted and playing the NBA for a couple of years, rose to um, a level of stardom as Lynn Sandy took off as an overnight sensation. I actually remember the game that he played um, against uh, the New Jersey Nets. I remember seeing that in real time and just um, having known who he was over the years, I was really excited to see what was happening in that moment. He, of course, has played for lots of different NBA teams, including the Warriors, the Knicks, and the Rockets. He's currently playing for the Beijing Ducks in the 2021 to 2022 season. And I believe you all are in the playoffs, so I want to wish him the best of luck in that as well. Also wanted to highlight some of the different community things that he's been involved in. In 2020, his Be The Light campaign donated $1.4 million to COVID relief efforts and helped raise greater awareness of increasing anti-Asian racism during the pandemic. He's also been appointed as UNICEF USA's uh, ambassador and in that role, he uses his platform to champion children's rights and to also help create more equitable world for every child. His Jeremy Lin Foundation also serves 22,000 youth, over 22,000 youth, and they've done this through grants, narrative change, community empowerment, and racial solidarity. So again, someone who has used his platform and continued to be really invested in the community, and I'm honored to welcome Jeremy Lin to the Addy Hour podcast. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. Of course, and I'm glad to have this come to fruition. This is something we've actually been talking about for quite a while and took some time to get everything coordinated. So again, grateful to both of you for being able to, uh, to be here today. But as my listeners know, I always like to just check in and see how people are doing overall. So I want to just get a sense of how you're both doing you know, at this point in time and also what your day-to-day -day looks like, um, if as much as you'd be willing to share. So Jeremy, why don't we uh, go in reverse order and start with you? Um, yeah, I'm, I currently, uh, last night was well, morning right now in, in China. And so last night we got to the playoff bubble, um, in Nantang in China. And so, um, the whole season has been played in different bubbles and these bubbles are in different cities. So we can only be in the hotel and go to the gym and the arena to compete and then come back. Wow. And so, um, we just got here. Our first playoff game is in three days um and and from there it's going to be you know just we'll see how you know how how far we go but it's going to be four round playoffs um and that's basically it um other than that um it's been you know i've been 
you know, over here for the last uh, about nine, 10 months uh, for this season. And so it, it's about to wind down. Um, we're about to see how the season finishes. Um, but everything else is great. I'm excited. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm excited to talk with uh, Dr. Chu and uh, didn't realize we had a lot of Yale uh, <laughs> Yale background here. I, I wasn't warned of this as I came into this <laughs> podcast, but uh, but uh, I think I'll I, th I think I'll do my best. No, I'll, we'll be able hold, to, you're going to hold your own. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's just keep it civil while we're recording, you know, and then it can all it can all break down after that. <laughs> We'll definitely appreciate it. Maybe it's a reason we didn't warn you ahead of time, but like, like I said, I'm sure you're going to hold your own <laughs> and congrats on making the playoffs too. One, one quick follow-up question to you, just as you were describing the bubbles and all that, what was it like coming from here in the U S not that you haven't been in China before, but especially during this time and transitioning into a different place where there are different protocols in place. Like how has that process been for you? It's been, it's been the most, um, eye-opening experience um, just to just to get to China um, the amount of work the amount of tests things that you have to do and I'll touch on this probably later in but when I landed um, I was you know before I took off I was negative I landed I was negative but on my third day of my 21 day hotel quarantine I tested positive mm. for COVID I still don't know how and no one else on the flight was positive and I wow. ended up spending 11 weeks in um, isolated quarantine in a very small room in in the hospital um, in the hospital in the hotel trying to and, and so when I say like the amount of I mean we'll get into this later but it was almost three months where wow. I, I did not see the outside or breathe you know any air from the outside and wow um, and you couldn't do laundry, you couldn't do anything. It was, it was, it was a quite an experience, and that definitely, you know, we'll talk about mental health and all that yeah. later. But it's yeah. it's different. But then now here, it's like a zero, almost it's a zero tolerance policy. Mm -hmm. And so when you're, you know, in a country of 1.5 billion, they basically have hardly any cases, um, very very few, um, and they're typically all from people who are flying in. Mm -hmm. And so it's also very different because when you're walking around day to day, there's essentially no threat. I mean, you are basically living in a bubble already, mm -hmm. um, but then we're in a bubble inside of a bubble. Yeah. Wow. That's a totally different setup in a lot of ways. So, I mean, I appreciate you sharing that and giving people some insight into what that experience has been like too. Um, I think it's important for us to realize how different things are moving in different parts of the world. And then also, like you mentioned, some of the, uh, the outcomes of that too, but I'm sure we'll loop back to that just in terms of the mental health component of that too as you mentioned so yeah Esther what about you how's life been for you um these days especially you know as an ER doctor with everything that we're continuing to navigate yeah it's really interesting it's so interesting to hear your story Jeremy because I think I mean there's that element of my life that's about the ER and and it's kind of not what you think I mean we definitely have these surges um, and in Oregon, the most recent surges, the Delta and the Omicron were really the most significant. We dodged a lot of the, of the caseload from the early waves. It just didn't really hit Oregon hard. And then we were hit more, harder later. But during the surges, you have a lot of empathy. Everyone's like, how are you doing? Is the ER okay? You know, but when you kind of mobilize your energy and your spirit for those surges, you know, and what I think what people don't realize is that between the surges is actually really hard too, because that's when everything comes crashing down on you. I mean, all of that care that was delayed, you know, people kind of held off going to the hospital, the surgeries were put off. Um, we use a ton of people resources and then the surge is over and all of that kind of comes crashing down on you. And so, um, I mean, there's a piece that just was published by a friend of mine, the Washington Post, that was enumerating all the shortages that we have in the emergency department. I mean, supply chains are mm -hmm. still affected globally, you know, so we don't have things like sailing bags, IV tubing, the ability to measure kidney function, um, a host of medications that you use every single day. Every other day is a medication shortage notice, like this wow. drug that you need, um, that you just think will always be there is in short supply, periodically different types of PPE, um, the protective gear still in short supply. And then the biggest one, of course, is the human 
supply that we're running out of because um, we've lost, you know, a fifth or more of our workforce, mm -hmm. many, many nurses. We're always scrambling just to fill shifts. And so I don't really remember what normal was in the hospital yeah. before, but we don't have it during surges. We don't have it after surges. Um, we're always diverting patients away as a specialty hospital. And so um, there is that whole element. And then I think, um, and then I think just like what's striking as I listened to Jeremy tell a story about these like incredibly rigorous processes to keep people safe. Um, and then I know you're in a special MBA bubble within that bubble, but I would say we are now in the US in this really surreal environment where people are completely not taking any precautions. You know, <laughs> we're like, there, there's still not adequate testing. We don't have surveillance programs in most settings. Um, I went to church the other day and uh, I was the, uh, my family was the only one in masks, you know, with a third of the congregation elderly mm -hmm. um, and people coughing and sneezing in a closed space. And we were just, um, it's, uh, it's not even suggested to be careful. And just in a lot of places in the United States, there's no concept of the fact that there is a global pandemic happening and we contribute to that with our individual decision-making. So that has been really demoralizing to see for people who are you know, spending so much time in the hospital and sealing the tail end of that, because of course there's a lot of people who because of misinformation or because of their medical conditions are not able to be vaccinated, to you know, have a good, good protections from coronavirus when they're exposed. So, um, but that being said, I feel very, I mean, I've been in the ER this entire time. Um, I sometimes am not perfect about my PPE. Somehow, I feel like I should knock on wood and I'm cursing myself, but somehow I have uh, not gotten COVID yet. And so, you know, you, you never take that for granted, but yeah. we've been really blessed. My husband is a physician also. We've, all, we've both been um, exposed many times um, in our community and at work. And um, so far have our whole family has stayed wow. pretty healthy. Um, so just feeling very lucky to, to this point to have had that gift in our lives. Yeah, definitely a blessing in a lot of ways. I appreciate you just, you know, even peeling back the layers to just give all the perspectives. I think so much of the time it's easy for people who aren't in the medical setting day to day to realize what's happening in between and all the challenges that are still there. Um, so I appreciate that level of of honesty and just the realness of it too. But like you said, also the blessing of not having contracted COVID and just being able to continue to walk through in a lot of ways. So thanks for that, um, that perspective in a lot of ways. And to both of you, just for, you know, the, the PCGRA is starting to bring out. Um, I know it's a lot we could unpack from just those two comments that you both, uh, you both made. But one thing, you know, that we'll do in the conversation too is also kind of lean into the, um, the AAPI space of things to the Asian, Asian American Pacific Islander component. And I did just want to lead off just, you know, acknowledging that that's a very imperfect term in a lot of ways, even though that's what we often use in these conversations. So I want to make sure that that was also a point of emphasis. And also, you know, just with the expectation that I would imagine our listeners are not going to be expecting the two of you to speak on behalf of the entire racially diverse and uh, uh, AAPI communities um, in that sense as well. But then also just having some insights from your experiences to um, just based on the experiences you've had in your own lives and the interactions with family and, and friends and things like that. So not that those are disclaimers, but I also just wanted to make sure that we really, you know, keep things in context because it's so easy sometimes to overgeneralize, but then it's also easy to miss the important components there. there. So, you know, as much as we can kind of hold both of those together, I think is important. Um, but just to start out, I know we'll get into the mental health component a little bit too, but just wanted to hear a little bit about both of your experiences in terms of growing up um, just at, in your communities in large and how this aspect of being uh, a member of the AAPI community has also factored into that. So Esther, actually, if we could start with you, that'd be great. Yeah, sure. Um, I am the child of immigrants. So my parents moved here for grad school and then from South Korea, what is now South Korea, and mm -hmm. then um, never left. Um, they kind of thought they were coming just for my father's education. This was in the 1960s. Um, so this is a very common story for uh, Koreans who had a similar background and mm -hmm. ended up having their kids here and then never left. So I was born here in the United States. And, um, and we lived in a pretty um, not ethnically diverse community on the west side of Cleveland. And so I didn't grow up around a lot of other Koreans, but we did go to a Korean church for a while. And so that was kind of my exposure. Um, so really the, the to, you know, almost the entirety of my experience with other Asians was my family, um, mm. my immediate family and my extended family. But I think some of those things really carried over nicely to um, 
to what I experienced when I was part of a larger Asian community from college onwards. Um, I think in terms of some of the topics we're going to talk about later on in this or throughout this podcast, I think, um, you know, just uh, I don't ever remember mental health being part of the conversation. Um, I do think um, kind of being stoic and strong and resilient and not sharing your feelings too much was kind of the ethos in my family. Um, mm -hmm. We just weren't a warm, it was very loving, but there was not a lot of warm, fuzzy talk. Um, and certainly we never spoke about what I now understand were um, a lot of mental health problems across our extended family. You know, you kind of understood that somebody was ill and had to go away for a while. Um, or there was just that cousin who um, was very shy and so never came out <laughs> when the rest of us were gathering. And, uh, you know, only much later um, when we started talking about these things, did we realize that we, were, we weren't we were perfect. What was happening is we just didn't talk about things like substance mm -hmm. use, um, addiction, mental health, suicide. Those things um, mm -hmm. were all given um, kind of euphemisms um, or completely not addressed at all um, and not talked about. So I think even mentioning things like being depressed or, or needing um, therapy or needing to be on medications. Those are things I all learned um, on my own as an adult uh, and really had to reconcile them against um, kind of the implicit uh, values and practices um, that I learned growing up. Yeah. I appreciate you sharing that and giving, giving that perspective and that honesty again as well. Uh, Jeremy, what about for you? Um, yeah, I've had, you know, I, my uh, background is, uh, pretty interesting. Um, my, my grandparents, um, born and raised in Zhejiang, which is, uh, you know, a province and, 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 they, and they grew up in a city, um, very close to Shanghai, like driving distance from Shanghai. Mm -hmm. Actually, it was, uh, it was like 10 minutes away from the COVID hospital that I spent all that time at. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, and then my, my parents, um, were born and raised, um, in Taipei and then I was born uh born and raised in California mm -hmm. and so um growing up is really interesting because um uh, similar to Dr. Chu like my my main exposure to other Asians was basically just at home or when I would go to church and I went mm -hmm. to uh, I went to a, a, a Chinese church and so um there it was like my Asian circle and I was also, you know, very fit in with how I was raised and the culture that I was raised in. But then I grew up in Palo Alto, which is, you know, primarily white community, going to school, um, primarily white, um, and Harvard as well. Um, just, you know, um, having that kind of school background, but then I would play basketball and I play competitive basketball, um, playing in the AAU circuit. Mm -hmm. And so it felt like <clears throat> that was primarily African-American. And so it felt like I had these three different worlds that I lived in and there was nobody that could really understand, you know, uh, if I had someone in my, in one circle, they might not understand what it was like in one of the other circles. And, and there wasn't that much, you know, carryover. Mm -hmm. um, and so aside from being at home and at church, I was always kind of like, um, labeled a little bit as like oh he you know because people knew i played basketball but there mm -hmm. it was always like you know he's asian but he's asian basketball player that's asian basketball player and mm -hmm. so it never really felt like i could you know uh, it always felt like i was like you know and for i guess a good reason they respected that i could play basketball mm -hmm. but it was always kind of like oh he's the asian um and so that was just something that i kind of got used to um but that was my experience and um, very similar to Dr. Chu, just a lot of things weren't really talked about when it came to mental health, um, mm -hmm. even things I had to learn about, many things I learned about um, once I became a professional basketball player and, and start just have to tap into the mind and sports psychology a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, but it was very, it was something where even as of late, when, you know, when I started to go to therapy, um, you know, one of the initial questions that, you know, um, was asked to me by one of my parents, like, oh, what's, what's wrong? Like, are you sure you, like, you don't, you might not need that and it was mm. not ill-intentioned at all it was just that's kind of you know it's like oh no you don't need it or you need medication or or no no no. like immediately it's like oh what's wrong instead of it kind of being seen as this is just a, a very helpful like life tool that can be used to process emotions to mm. get through certain things to be able to just be a better person like you would want to eat healthy you want to work out you want to sleep well and you want to do things for 
your holistic well-being this is definitely you know a very important part that that plays into that yeah we appreciate you sharing that and again i mean there's so many overlapping themes as you as you were talking between um both of you just in terms of navigating different spaces um being here in the states you know having those family connections and sometimes other connections but then also kind of trying to navigate between different cultural um, groups as well but i mean it also seems like the theme of that was just the, the mental health component wasn't really talked about all that much now i'd say you know maybe as an outsider that's kind of been similar to some of my perceptions as well so in college i did have a couple of korean american um roommates as well and you know i did join them at their korean churches at times so i got to you know dabble here and there and experience some of the culture um it's funny i remember at one point also playing in a um i can't remember the name of the league but there was a uh, like a basketball tournament at the university of north carolina at chapel hill for one of the asian student associations every but every team was allowed one non-Asian basketball player. And of course, every non-Asian basketball player was black. So it ended up being those two groups. I don't know why I went there, but so <laughs> maybe Jeremy talking about basketball just reminded me of that. that. That's its own interesting phenomenon, but just, you know, kind of some of those cultural um, pieces that I've just, you know, seen them navigate and have been able to navigate um, with them as well. But again, just that mental health piece, I don't ever remember that being talked about. I mean, this is late 90s early 2000s. Um, and then even the 2010s, you know, there were lots of different um, articles from different colleges where people would talk about, you know, the silent struggles that students were having. Often they were talking about Asian American communities, black and brown communities, just that people were kind of navigating and struggling and walking through in silence and not feeling like they had any space to talk about it. Or they would get some help at, on campus, but then go home and feel like they couldn't bring that same conversation up because of all the different ways that things were looked about, uh, looked at. So, I mean, I think I'm mirroring a lot of what you all have said. And I'm just curious if you've seen things shift in a sense. I mean, Jeremy, you talked about going to therapy. Esther, you talked about knowing what some of those things are now. Have you seen things shift in terms of acknowledgement in different AAPI communities, or do you think it's more at the individual level at this point, or a mixture of both? In my personal experience, I've definitely seen at least some level of shift because there's just a lot more people talking about it mm. um but maybe it's in certain circles or or whatever but even within my own family as well as some of a lot of my friends as they start to talk about it because mental health has become you know one of the biggest things since the pandemic that at least certain areas are starting to make pushes for in terms of exposure and awareness and and so even you know in my foundation just we talked to some kids uh, from from some of the grantees and they're talking about and they're going home and talking to their parents and oh, they're wow. talking about how they need more mental health resources in their schools. And and it's definitely a different vibe than when I was growing up. And um, and I think even after, you know, you know, between me and some of my friends and us talking about our mental health with our parents, I started to see some different shifts happening. I mean, mm -hmm. a great example that I had um, was this past year. I went to eat with like six or seven people um, and they're primarily my agents in um, in China um, and as well as, you know, uh, another athlete in the CBA, uh, another basketball player in the CBA and some friends. And as we were all eating, we started to kind of talk about panic attacks. Mm -hmm. And so we had mentioned this, this concept of panic attacks and immediately one person was like, oh, is it really that that happens? Like, I didn't realize that like, wait, so, and he started asking these questions and he was like, man, the, the, it can't be that common. It what ended up happening by the end of the conversation. Everybody went around mm -hmm. and said that they have had panic attacks, multiple panic attacks. And, and, and this group of friends has been friends for over a decade. Wow. And they never talked about it and never knew about it and never heard of it. And every single person went around talking about how they had a panic attack here. Or this person struggled with panic attacks occasionally, or this person had one here. And, and all of a sudden it was like, at the end of the conversation, um, the guy was like, my agent was like, wow. So it looks like I, I, I might be the only one at this table who, you know, um, you know, who, who has no idea what this feels like. And <laughs> Wow. Um, and so it was just, it was just really eye-opening to me to realize, like, because when you go through these things, you feel alone and you feel mm -hmm. like you don't know who to talk to. There's no one else that can, you can talk to about. And so that kind of really challenged me too, like to continue to try to use my voice, my mm -hmm. platform more and, and to kind of fight more for, uh, mental health and, and, 
breaking that stigma. But I yeah. do think to answer your question there, we are headed in the right direction at least. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's a really helpful story to hear. I mean, just the way that came about too. Uh, just the awareness, the level of awareness. Cause like I said, everybody was kind of going through it in isolation. And the one person who had an experience had no idea how common it was. So yeah, that's really telling. Esther, have you seen things shift from your perspective? <sighs> Yeah, I'm I'm sort of going in circles as I listen to Jeremy's story because I, I do think we're still so early in this process as an Asian American community, um, as a global Asian community. Uh, I mean, I, I, I think of how, um, I mean, I almost remember to the day or at least the week or the era when I had conversations with my friends about David Chang, you know, the chef talking about his mental health and how that was such a big deal when he was so open and mm -hmm. wrote about it in his book. And I remember mentioning it to a friend and, um, and Jeremy, your name came up because it's like, you know, it's, it's really cool to see, to see even athletes, Asian athlete talking about mm -hmm. mental health like that. And just, it's still in this era where when somebody who's recognized and like comfortable that you, you know, that you relate to like you guys, um, talking about this topic, it's still one of those, like, uh, people are surprised, you know, it's like this in, in a wonderful way, but I still hear the surprise in people's mm -hmm. voices. It's not like, oh yeah, you know, a 500th famous Asian person we know is talking about mental health. Yeah. They, they all talk, but it's, it's like still this wow moment mm -hmm. because you don't, I still react with surprise. And I mean, I'm much older than you are. So I still, you know, I am carrying with me kind of the expectations and norms of a slightly different generation. Mm -hmm. um, but I think for me and my peers, there's this, oh yeah, we can talk about this now. You know, it's like, we've all been quietly going to therapy, but now we can talk about this, but I do see it more. Um, I do feel like the response is so positive now that people are really loving to see those messages. Mm -hmm. um, I think from a, a researcher's perspective, because so much of my time is in research, when we talk about Asian American and Pacific Islander health disparities around mental health, so much of it is just the numbers part of it, you know, because of the reluctance to report mm -hmm. um, kind of collides with our poor data collection um, when it comes to any health problems among um, Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. So I, I think, you know, when you think about all the steps you need to take to appropriately address a health problem, you have to like understand the problem and collect the data and then devote the appropriate resources to it and develop good target outcomes. And, you know, you go through that whole process. A lot of times with Asian American um, mental health problems, we're really starting at the data collection, understanding the problem, mm -hmm. because it's been so hard to, um, you know, to get people to report, <laughs> you know, to, to seek help, to, you know, register as a, as a, you know, as a dot when you're looking at all the, you know, the health services that are used, for example. So um, I think I think some days I feel like, wow, we've got so far to go to actually feel like we're robustly mm -hmm. addressing mental health problems. And then there's times where I feel like there's just so many, you know, increasingly more inspirational stories and people so hungry to hear those stories mm -hmm. and feel like, okay, you know, like that conversation can happen. And people like, like Jeremy and David are, are making these huge, it's like, you know, uh, uh, just like a single voice like that, I feel like has these huge ripple effects. It gives people permission to have those conversations with their friends, um, mm -hmm. to use people that, you know, are well known to as kind of a starting point for those conversations. And that, that didn't happen when I grew up. Um, yeah. Never, never. I can't think of a single, wow. you know, Asian person that I looked up to um, who really used mental health as like a major part of what they wanted to talk about. So just hearing it, seeing it now is incredibly moving and makes me feel like, ah, oh, you know, there's hope. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like a breath of fresh air in a lot of ways too, which is really, really important. I mean, you also highlight so many important topics of where things need to move also in terms of, I mean, you know, some of the maybe a year or two old, two, one to two year old statistics saying that, you know, 23% of those in the API community actually seek out help. So, you know, Jeremy, even as you were sharing your story, part of what I was wondering was like, okay, well, all those people are hearing that from each other for the first time. One layer of me wonders like, did people actually seek out help when they were going through those panic attacks or were people kind of walking through that in isolation? Um, and so like it, I had a mixed feeling like I was, oh, I'm so glad this is actually happening in terms of the conversations people are realizing, but I'm also hoping that that 
level of not having gone to that point isn't happening on a larger scale in some ways too. You know, not to be pessimistic, but that's kind of that's kind of where my mind went hearing both of those. And so I wonder if you all would be willing to talk about that aspect too. Like, are there ways that you know we as a society or individuals can help people move to that place of actually wanting to seek out their help? Or is it still the stigma that really needs to kind of be broken down first? Like, where do you see some of the tension points and areas where we can move that forward? I okay. I'll, I'll go. Uh, I guess to <laughs> leave it too open ended. <laughs> um, I mean, I I agree a lot with Doctor Chu that a lot of times when you say these things, there's a lot of shock, and mm -hmm. um, but then by the end of the conversation, it seems to always move in a good place. Now, whether okay. you know, so going back to that story, um. I kind of shared, I, I was going through therapy. They were there with me when, you know, not in the room, but they were waiting for me to get out when I went through that 11 week period of mm -hmm. being confined in a very small room. And that's when I started therapy. Mm -hmm. And so as I was talking about it with them, um, even, you know, there was mixed, re there's, was, there's was mixed reactions. Like for some people, when they're talking about their panic attacks, like some people, they didn't even know they're like, Oh, mm -hmm. So it's called a panic attack. Like people are like, oh, you know, another friend was like, I actually went online and I researched and I was like, what is this? What and why is this happening? And then that's how he came to realize it was panic attacks. Then, you know, other people, you know, you know, other people had, you know, have, you know, figured it out and, and try trying to do something about it. And so there's like a whole wide, you know, this is an array of kind of how everybody deals with it. Mm -hmm. But the truth is the reality is still that like nobody at that table ever talked about with anybody else at that table mm. and didn't know that everyone was going through it and everybody, you know, and so for me, it's like, again, it's like the first, you know, you're, you're scratching the surface of what it could or should mm. be. Mm. And, but at least now we're scratching the surface yeah. and, and we're kind of starting to bang at that door. Um, and so, and even for me, when I shared to, to tell people like, Hey, I started therapy, I almost have to like, you know, my eyes are open, but in my mind, I almost close my eyes for the next three seconds because, you know, every time I say that, a lot of people are like, or like, wait, what happened? Or like, why? And it's like, so I have to like blind myself to like the shock. Otherwise it'll make me feel a little insecure. Like, oh shoot, something's wrong with me. Or why am I doing, are you sure I need it? Like, and so even when I say it, I, I kind of just say like, hey, let them have the reaction they're going to have and then explain it and mm -hmm. talk about it a little bit more in depth. And typically by the end, and it's kind of what you said on the beginning of this podcast, like authenticity always works the best. And if I just share from my heart, they kind of realize, oh, wow, like I probably struggle with some level of anxiety. I probably have some of these, you know, foreboding thoughts. I probably mm -hmm. process emotions inadequately and experiences inadequately that affect me in the long term. And, and so I think there's just a certain level of, again, you're breaking through that stigma of like, mm -hmm. oh, just because I go to therapy means X, Y, or Z. And, and that's not where I'm at. So I don't need that. I'm not like one of them is kind of the mentality that some people might have. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I agree. There's a long way to go, but at least we're starting. And and um, and it does seem like, for the most part, I've had much more stories of like people being very positive and receptive about hearing about it than the other way. Yeah, I think that's really great. You're giving people that grace too. I mean, that, that's a fine line to walk, giving them the grace to kind of react, but then also protecting yourself in a sense too, so you don't start to second guess the choices and decisions that you've made, which are also very, very helpful. So I definitely commend can you I, on that because that's can, not easy. Can, Go ahead, Esther. Can I, can I ask, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry if this is off topic, but I, I'm no, really curious good. about this 11 weeks. Um, did you know going in, it would be about that time period? Is it, um, was it persistent positive tests or symptoms or how did it end up being, that seems like a very long time. Yeah, um, well, I think, you know, um, generally speaking, the, the, the test standards here um, is about, you know, I would say like three X, three to four X more strict in terms of like the bacteria count. And so, yeah. um, so the typical, I remember, you know, for me, it was like, they were expecting, you know, an, on average two to three weeks and I'd be fine. Mm -hmm. The problem is I, I actually, you know, I have 
a broken nose. I broke my nose many times from basketball. And so um, the, I couldn't flush out the dead virus from my nasal cavity fast enough. Wow. And so I would have these like really inconsistent tests. And so I would have a ton of dead bacteria, but it was getting picked up and it was enough to, to, to be positive. So what was actually pretty crazy is I actually, you know, there's a protocol for how you test out and you have to get negative on back-to-back -back tests. And mm -hmm. so I did that um, and, I, and, and I had the hospital COVID test and then I had the CDC COVID test and I was fine. And I went back into, to restart my 21 day hotel quarantine. And then on the seventh day, I retested positive even though, you know, for me, I was vaccinated. And so um, there was a lot of, um, the, yeah, there, or, or sorry, not bacteria, virus, um, but there, the, the dead virus. And so that was the main issue. And so I had to go back again and then stay there for oh a few more weeks until wow. they came back completely clean. It was, um, yeah, it was, it was tough because like this whole time, my whole like signature shoe launch, my Asia tour, the start of my season, ah. like everything that I had prepared for, I lost all of it. And, and wow. so um, I missed a third of my season. And, 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 and because I was vaccinated, I actually was asymptomatic for, <laughs> of those 77 days, I was asymptomatic for the last like 60 something. Um, wow. and, and, and I never had too many symptoms, but that's just how wow. it goes. And, and so, um, really to be honest at that point it was more about like my body i, I think i lost like 15 20 pounds wow. of like weight because you know because I, I couldn't work out and i couldn't get enough food in my system and then also just my mind like and and that's where i'll be like very transparent is like being in this tiny little hospital room and there's no windows that they directly see outside and by the end it was like I didn't even want to be awake. Um, and so I started to like have this like suicidal ideation mm. of like, man, like, and, and my goal every day was to try to wake up as late as possible mm. and to try to be as awake for as little as possible. There are days where like, I wouldn't even want to get out of bed. I would just be laying there and lunch, breakfast would be put there. They would, the nurse would walk in, put breakfast and the nurse would walk in and put lunch. And I wouldn't even touch the food or open the, turn on the lights or and they're like are you okay are you still sleeping and it's just like i have no motivation i can't stare mm -hmm. at these four walls anymore like mm -hmm. yeah. you know talking to myself wow. all day um and so that was when i really hit a low point mm -hmm. and i was like yeah hey, i'm gonna go to therapy um and i started therapy um and, and in the past i've done like i've worked with sports psychologists and other mm -hmm. things like that and so um but this was like for me as a person holistically and and um and so that was my experience. It was something that oh my gosh. Uh, I'll yeah. never forget for wow. sure. Wow. Especially that piece where you moved towards getting out and then got yanked back in. It just must have been so crushing to have that hope and then to be back to square one. I just, because a lot of, I mean, I think a lot of it was just, I mean, is about expectations, you know? Mm -hmm. if you're if you're told from the outset that it's going to be this amount of time but to have it kind of so uncertain the entire time must have just been crushing for your brain and your spirit oh it was it was so crushing because the thing is like i my first negative test came on day 10 mm. but i didn't <sighs> officially clear out of the entire thing until day 77 yeah. wow so for the last oh, 67 God. days i'm thinking like you know, I'm almost there. I'm almost there. And, and again, when I, when, you, when I, it's called Fu Yang, like when you retest positive, mm. I was so upset that like my luggage and things, I didn't even like, there were some very expensive, some stuff where I was like, I don't even want it anymore. Mm. Like yeah. I was so angry and like, I was like sweating and like, no, this can't be happening. It was like a nightmare. And then mm. like, you take the test at 5 30 in the morning and you need to wait until 9 p.m at night wow. to get your results and so like the whole day is like i'm just like and every time a nurse walks by i'm like oh a nurse just walked by are they coming in oh it's bad news again and it's just like yeah it's just like this like thing where on the outside looking in, if i tell the story now i'm like oh it sounds bad but like to actually go through it and to go through that for 11 straight weeks watching yeah. like all my hard work and everything that I prepared for like dwindle and watching my body like just atrophy it was like 
And like you said, the expectation of it, yeah. the up and down, that was a killer. If I came in and someone's just like, it's going to be 77 days, I'll be like, all right, mentally lock in. I'm good. I just got to find a way to make it through. I got a little countdown. But it's because I kept thinking, I'm right around the corner. I'm right around the corner. And then it would be like, just kidding. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's wild. That's tough. It does, it does make me think, too, about it's something you said really early on, which is that mental health is just health. And I, I mean, when you describe going through that, mm -hmm. I actually think it would be abnormal if you didn't have an adverse mental health consequence from that, you know, just kind of like you're in a big car accident and it's normal for you to be injured. It's like, I don't actually know any person on earth, no matter how mentally strong they think they are, that could go through that experience and not have, you know, just like we talked a lot about that in healthcare, um, how in the pandemic, when we were all like in the hospital all the time, we were fearing for ourselves and our families and watching these people drown in their own secretions. And, you know, um, there was so much uncertainty and we were scared and, and people were like, yeah, you know, if you need it, you, you we have these resources for mental health. And at, at some point we were kind of like, what if we just say, we're going to assume you all need mental health mm -hmm. because in this circumstance, having an adverse symptom of mental health is normal. Like who would not have anxiety, depression, you know, hopelessness, PTSD. Um, so let's just package in some mental health there. And if you don't need it, you can opt out. I just feel like, yeah. could we have a more proactive, you know, especially for people who have a hard time asking for it um, because of cultural reasons or, you know, and norms. Um, it seems like maybe the system can do a little more, maybe healthcare can do a mm. little more to say, a normal symptom would be for you to need some therapy, medication, support groups around now, yeah. you know? Yeah. But I mean, that, your experiences, I mean, that's gotta be a very extreme human experience to go through. And I yeah. cannot imagine that. Yeah, I mean, everything you said is yeah, so, so on point. Yeah, because I mean, Jeremy, as you're describing that, I mean, all the circle, like what we do in studies basically you went through all that. I mean, if you just add on uncertainty over uncertainty over uncertainty, changing expectations, lack of motivation, like those are all the things like from a brain standpoint that lead people to just that state of being overwhelmed, not wanting to, to get up, get out of bed, do things. So, I mean, exactly like Esther was saying, like just needing to have those things in place proactively, I think is so important um, because in a lot of ways, when we're trying to look at those things in, in laboratory settings, um, we're trying to model chronic unpredictable stress is the term that people use. And that's exactly like, as you described, that's exactly what you were going through. And I think what, what made it so difficult. So, but also, I mean, I'm encouraged that you took the time to say, okay, I am actually going to look into therapy and not just let this be the way it is and to, to break through that as well. Um, I mean, one question I also wanted to ask you and have Esther also chime in. What did, because I, I can only imagine there's so much you must've learned going through that because it was so difficult what are things that you've taken from that that you're trying to hold on to moving forward because i would imagine there are there are lessons and things that you've learned in that moment that you don't just want to keep there in that moment yeah i mean i think as it ties tying it back, back into all of mental health i think the lesson that i one of the lessons that i learned is when people decide whether they need mental health support, they're acting as their own doctor. And so if you ask somebody who smokes regularly, like, they'll be like, oh, I'm, I'm okay. Like, I can still play basketball. I can still work out. I can still do. And it's like, yeah, but if you, if you, if you go on long enough, like, there's going to be adverse effects. But they're their own doctor. And, and, and what I realized with my mental health was even in the past when I had been more resistant to it, it was like, I don't, and it's what Dr. Chu just said, like no one comes out the same. It's not, that, that's a fact, it, but it's whether you realize it or not. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so for me, I realized a lot of these experiences were having effects. I just didn't realize it at the time. Mm -hmm. And so compartmentalizing it or sweeping it under the rug does not count as like, I'm okay. Because mm -hmm. that will build up and that will come back to get you somewhere later down the road in a different way. And, and you have to be aware of that. And so that's my like spiel on saying that, like when I went through this situation, when I got out, I was like, I'm finally out. Like, and I had this like breath of fresh air, like even just to feel the sun, mm. even to be able to walk down the hall, walk out that door and walk down the hall or to go down an elevator. Like these things, like I almost like 
when I, my first time walking down the street, I almost was freaking out at so many, all the lights, the cars, wow. because I was like, there's so much noise. And, and, and I was just so excited to live life. Mm. And I was like, okay, that part is over. And then I got into the season and in the season, I started off really poorly because my body was inactive for three yeah. months. Yeah. And I realized during the season, I remember after one of my worst games, I was like, I'm going to quit. I just want to go home. Like, I don't want to play basketball anymore. And I never really like, I never had such after a bad game, like it was, I wouldn't normally respond that way. Mm -hmm. And I start to think like, why am I so lacking motivation? Why do I want out so bad? What is wrong with my mindset? Like I've never been like this in my whole career. And that's when I realized, okay, what happened there and the amount of energy and the damage and the trauma that I took mm -hmm. is affecting me now, mm -hmm. even though I didn't expect it to happen. Um, and, and so I think that's really important to know that like, as you go through these experiences, like, they're building up and they're changing mm -hmm. you and they're changing the way you think. And they're changing, like for me, they changed my persistence factor and my perseverance because I just went through something that, mm -hmm. you know. And so again, if you asked me when I first got out, I'd be like, dude, I'm ready. Like I'm ready for the season. I'm ready for basketball. Like I'm tired of every, like I'm so excited. Now the minute that I, basketball started, I realized, dang, I have almost have nothing. I'm running on an empty tank. Mm -hmm. And so that's like, the one of the biggest things I learned is that like if you're not processing and healthily mm -hmm. processing everything you're going through it is continuing to change the what your subconscious and the way that you think mm -hmm. over and over and over again and and that like I said you don't want to wait until you know the person who's smoking you know two packs a day does not want to wait until the worst diagnosis to go and do something about it right and so that would be my one of, you know, maybe an analogy I would use yeah. for what I experienced with my mental health. Yeah, that's great. That's really, really telling in a lot of ways too. And I'm not going to jump into all neuroscience, even though I, I have that tendency, but just, you know, just to mention like everything you said, like we often talk about, you know, the experiences, they change our brains, whether that's positive experiences or challenging traumatic experiences, like what you had gone through and that has effects. And so you were seeing some of that happen, even though you weren't in that situation anymore. So I think it's so important that you were paying attention to that. Um, and I think that can go a long way to empower people as well. Um, we haven't talked about necessarily within the AAPI communities, but just trying to help people think about like, when we're talking about mental health, we aren't actually talking about our brains. And our brains do react to different situations and change in different situations, which impacts how we act in other situations. So, I mean, the way that you brought that up, I think is also important, but just then again, that level of awareness that I think is huge, so. I know we're running running short on time. This conversation definitely has flown by. Esther, I was just going to let you see if, if there's a last word that you also want to uh, to mention. I'll pass it back on to Jeremy to uh, to close us up too. But oh, I'm still kind of sitting in what you said because I think there's so much truth to that. So mm -hmm. I, I won't add on to it. I, I just think every, every word you said um, is what I wish I said better and more often to mm -hmm. you know my patients and um, anyone who listens when I message and even my kids. So thank you for all that. Yeah, really important. Really well said. Well, there was so much that you all brought in this conversation. I felt like it's could have gone on for much longer. I know there's other topics we could have uh, pulled in as well, but you know, perhaps maybe at some point in the future, we'll have a, uh, an, can't promise any, but another iteration of this in some sense, because I think there's a lot of important topics. Um, but definitely appreciate you all making the time to be here on this podcast, everything that you've shared so honestly. I mean, just kind of walking through what you've walked through, but also the hope that we have moving forward as well. Um, I know we didn't touch on the faith component, but I know that's also a very, a very big part of this. And again, for me, just kind of integrating the faith with what we understand about the brain and psychology and our experiences, I think it's so important for us to all help ourselves get to a better place as a community, not necessarily we're trying to do that ourselves, but having the community and having that uh, divine intervention as well. So definitely appreciate both of you. I know this is going to be a, an episode that lots of folks will get a lot from and hopefully will continue to help break the stigma, even, even as people hear your stories as well. So appreciate appreciate both of you and the time that you've taken to be here today. Thank you so much, Nee. Oh, thank you. Uh